Javon, where I wanted to start this conversation, I've been so excited to talk to you. Not just because of your charisma and who you are and your background and what you've accomplished, but because as well of the industry that you represent. It hit me in the shower this morning. I was like, wow, Javon has an incredible gig. You know why? Because he is in the business of making people's dreams come true. Like one of the things about a book is that for most people that want to do a book, the book is burning inside of them. These are authors that desperately want to get this art, this creation out into the world. And it's burning inside them and it's a dream. And the process that an individual often goes through to create and write and market and sell this book is very confusing. And here you are tackling this world of publishing, turning it upside down and making it accessible and digestible and possible and tangible and making that dream like an actual reality. Like it's just absolutely wild to me. So you must have seen so many and felt so many examples of this. Uh, and, and it must be just such a beautiful thing to see that, to help people make these dreams become a reality. So, all right, this this is awesome. So I, I feel like you sat in one of our company all hands or something. But, <laughs> but <laughs> because here's what, what's crazy is, as I tell people all the time, so, so many people say, okay, well, you, you've made a lot of money. You're, you're well off. Okay, why do you continue to do what you do? One, I have this firm belief that we can build this massive uh, media conglomerate and we can do it better than corporate America does by doing right by people first. But second to that, look at our mission. Look what we do. And, and you nailed it. It's like, I'm like, did he like read that from me somewhere? And, like, <laughs> no, I and, and I say to people, th think about this. Our mission is we help authors write, publish, and market their books. Our measurement at the end of each month is how many authors did we help achieve their dream or goal in becoming a published author. And I say that during, during our all hands, and, and this isn't to, to knock other companies, but you know, like Facebook, what, what's their goal? Okay, we, we, they'll tell you it's, uh, we connected more people. Mm, it's really how much more ad revenue did, did, did they get? How many more likes and hearts did, did we get? And, and even Nike, I love Nike. All my workout gear is Nike. So this isn't a knock on them, but the measurement is how much more uh, clothing, uh, brand apparel did, did we sell? Our mission is how many people did we help achieve their dream and goal of becoming a published author? Man, that's pretty cool. It's incredible. It's beyond cool. It's uh, it's one of the only businesses where such a thing is is possible. It probably makes the process of actually connecting and selling that service to these people much more easy because it's like they 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 view it as a giant. I mean, it, and it is this process of writing and publishing and marketing a book has had a huge. Uh, barrier to entry for so yeah. long. And that's another thing that you've accomplished is like, you've taken this industry and turned it upside down and shown people that the old way is basically obsolete at this point. In yep. your mind, is it 100% obsolete at this point? Is it like 90% obsolete at this point? You know, it's like, what I really think, and I know so many of the people that, that are, you know, fans of this podcast that follow my, you know, episodes, are entrepreneurs and already authors or want to become an author and they're sitting there going like should i self-publish or traditional publish number one question i know they're constantly asking and the only reason they're asking should i traditional publish is because well that's what we were taught like that's right, how you do right. it but what's your perspective on that you know first it, here, here's something interesting so so we pride ourselves on we've created our own lane at this point. So there's traditional publishing, everyone knows traditional, and then there's self-publishing. Now, call us arrogant, but we, we view self-publishing as you ran down to FedEx Kinko's and you stapled some stuff together. And what we've created is professional publishing. You can look at our books, remember you can see them behind me, I'm, I'm here in the, the office, you can see our scribe library behind us. And you can go set any of these books on the counter at Barnes and Noble, and you won't know if it's a, a random house, if it's a penguin, Harper Collins, or if it's scribe. You, you can't tell the difference. So we carved our uh, lane, if you will, professional publishing. 
And to your point, people always have the question, do I go uh, traditional or do I go with scribe? And mm -hmm. so many people are caught up in the, oh, well, I got to go traditional because it's, it's a vanity thing for them to feel that they were accepted, that someone said, oh, okay, I went with HarperCollins, Penguin accepted me, uh, you know, and, and if that's your thing, we, we, we're not going to knock you, do, do you, but David Goggins is one of the greatest examples of owning his book. Mm -hmm. He was going to go the traditional route. They offered him, in, in his public knowledge, they offered him a $350,000 advance. But traditional owns you. They own your book. They own your content. And on the back end, you may get 10, 15% royalties of your book. So David said, nope, I'm going to go with Scribe. People told him he was a fool. They told him the book would never sell. The day he published, the day we launched his book, he doubled what that advance was going to be would have been yes double. <laughs> that's so good the, that's the so day. good man <laughs> and, and so and even to this day now that's one of the best selling memoirs of all time and yes. so you know that that book has gone on to do wonders uh for him his career uh the success and you know and he owns all the rights to yeah to the audio book. the ebook yep. everything because they and, want that from you now. They, they want the want audio that from, from you. you. Yes, yeah, he owns the yeah. audio. But, but here's what's really important. So many people doubted that he could become a New York Times bestselling author, a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, and a, a USA Today bestselling author. He did all three, and he mm -hmm. published with us. And so he he's really uh, done away with this whole you need to go traditional publishing so I would, to your, your question directly, is it 90%, is it 70? Uh, I believe there's still a vanity play there as well, where so many people still want that uh, traditional publishing, Harper Collins, what, whatever. E even the whole New York Times, I'm a New York Times bestselling author. Well, um, I, I hate to burst a lot of people's bubbles, but there's a ton of people who actually pay and gamify oh, to, yeah. to get on that list. I know them. Uh, yeah, exa exactly. So it, it's it's not as meaningful as it once was. And, and I tell people this all the time. Define success in your book. Why are you doing the book? If, if it's truly to sell a million copies and say you're a New York Times bestselling author, don't publish with us. You know that you're seeking fame. Don't go with us. Um, matter of fact, go, go call the Kardashians because, you know, fame, that's their business model. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not our business model. We want to help authors who have a purpose for doing their book credibility lead generation thought leadership legacy mm. piece those are the people we want to work with mm. it could serve as a wonderful marketing tool that you actually yes. even might be able to make some money on as well i mean yep when you get when you get a hundred thousand dollar advance i mean it basically works down to like these days what three dollars a book or so that you're earning from the publisher you gotta sell 30 plus thousand copies just to earn that back. Yep. And even then earning $3 a copy versus like what you could be earning with Scribe, it's it's plus not to mention the the audio rights and things like that, which these days audio is huge. Audio like is huge. people earn most of their of their money and that's only for people that are actually attempting to try to make any money from the book itself. Because again, like, you know, as a lead generation tool, as a marketing arm for your business, like you can, maybe people will want to hire you for whatever you do on the back end. Like that's where the money should be made and your totally. heart and soul goes into the book to create a beautiful standalone piece of content, this book that then exposes the world to you. It just makes so much more sense that way. So so you just now, that matter, matter of fact, I'll share this with you, give you some transparency. So we've worked with almost 2000 authors now and we went through and we parsed out uh, a lot of our authors. We've got about 250 of our authors who have never sold more than 100 copies of their book, but mm -hmm. each one of them have landed six and seven figure contracts by way of their book. So they're like, hell yeah, I was successful. That's exactly why I did my book. And, and that's the point. Those are the people we want to work with because that's success wow. for them. They sure. wanted to, they wanted they that lead generation. It. 
Yes. And so it, it wasn't success was not based on book sales. If anyone comes to us and, and that's their definition of success, we turn them away. And like I said, we, we turn away about 30, 35 percent of the people that come to us. Hmm. Now, this is a very small segment of the market, but just to break into the fundamentals of the money side of it a little bit, when you go traditional, you're essentially uh, having this publisher invest in you with some form of an advance. But I think more importantly for some people, it's that they are covering the cost of production. They're covering the cost of the editing, the book cover, you know, all, all of that stuff versus when you go with Scribe, you front the money to a certain right. degree, depending on the package that you would like and how much help and support that you need. But ultimately, you own all the rights. And owning all the rights means instead of getting at the top rate these days, and I'll also be transparent about my journey with you during this because I've been updating my audience on my book publishing journey. The top end of what you're going to earn is 15%. The right. offer I just got requires 20,000 copies to be sold to earn that escalator level of the 15%. Yeah. Below that is like 10% and then, you know, there's thresholds. So you got to sell 20,000 copies to get to the point where you've earned 15%. 15% versus essentially 100%. What you're basically doing in your mind and when you sit down and you calculate this and you really look at it in a simple spreadsheet or however a person likes to analyze this, you're basically just trading short term reward yeah. for long-term profit and success. And, and I think that's a very interesting thing is like if you're willing to invest in yourself a little bit and you're confident that you can sell books, doesn't it make more sense for this niche of the audience that knows that they can sell 20, 30, 40,000 copies right. to just be like, well, wait a second, like why don't I spend 10, 12, even $40,000 for that ultimate kind of bigger package with Scribe to, to create the book and earn, I would earn that back fairly quickly within the first right. few months if I knew I was going to sell. So like, how do you go through that process mentally for people or even for your, for yourself in terms of thinking about the numbers? Cause people get distracted by that advance and by that cost being covered. Well, so, so a couple of things, first and foremost, there's, there's, Few and far between uh, of people like yourself, they can go out and actually get an advance from a tra mm -hmm. traditional publisher. Fact of the matter is traditional publishing now is only interested in you if you have a million Instagram followers, two million uh, right. Facebook followers. You, you have Because the name of the game for traditional publishing is book sales. So for them, if it, they have to see, okay, there's going to be a return on this investment and very few people get that advance. You know, people heard, heard me say David Goggins, 350 grand, very few people get that type of advance. More of them are in the range of five, $10,000. Some don't even get an advance. They're, they're, they're yes. traditional just taking a shot on the book and let's see if we get some book sales out of this. And they're not going to put any marketing uh, budget behind it as well. So uh, when we talk people through it again, what mm. is the purpose of the book? What are we trying to accomplish? Are, are you trying to be on more stages to speak? Are you trying to sell more people into your course? Are you trying to land more consulting uh, opportunities? So we walk through what, let's define success. And we mm -hmm. fast forward. This is part we, of the pro process. This is part of author? the process with, with every Beautiful. conversation that we have. And, and we always say this, we don't actually sell anything. We tell you what we do, how we do it. And if you're interested, great work with us, but there's no hard sell where we we've never done an outbound cold call. You know, we're not calling mm -hmm. up Jamie Dimon. Hey, Jamie Dimon, want to do a book? No, that's not, that's not what we do. Everything <laughs> yeah. is word of mouth. Um, the free content we put out, you you've seen this. We believe everyone should do their book. And in holding true to that, yes, we have our packages that range anywhere from 120,000 all the way down to 15,000. However, we give away all of our content on how someone can actually do their book for free. We give it away. Mm -hmm. And why that's important is if we truly believe everyone should do their book, 
then we got to hold true to showing mm. everyone how to do their book. But yeah, very few people uh, receive in advance that upfront money, uh, traditional publishing uh, uh, route that someone can get accepted into. Yeah. So you're, you're just seeing more and more. Think about it. We're six years old and 2,000 people have worked with us. Why? <sighs> They're, they're start, they're, they're, the writing is starting to be on the wall on, on yeah. there's a better way. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you talk to authors these days, um, so there's so, there's something interesting that, that I've actually heard. And I love having this conversation with you because I'm in an interesting position where um, there are two publishers that, you know, are, have stepped forward. One of them made a very clear offer. And I'm in that position where you're literally catching me in the moment where I haven't decided what <laughs> path I'm going to take. Like, I literally haven't decided. Am I going with Scribe? Or I... And then there's this other one, like, where they do a profit share model, Ben Bella, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I'm like, why would you, why not just pay that ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 yourself and keep 100% versus, like, a profit share? I'm like, so I'm going through all this math, right? And at the end of the day... Uh, I think that where, you know, I'm in that situation, like I said, where, um, yes, an advance was possible and a conversation with publishers was possible, but it's so interesting because I've been documenting this journey and I thought that like, I'm 80% going to go down this path of traditional. Um, and, and one of the things that I heard, because I, I, I wonder if you have a reaction to this is someone once said to me, they were like, the only people that say you should uh, self-publish or go with a hybrid publisher are those people that can't get a traditional deal. And I sat there and I was like, you know, to a certain level, that kind of is true for some people. But then you have this David Goggins example, yeah, $350,000. And he's not the only example. There are so no. many examples of people that are like, the fundamentals don't make sense. I need to own the rights. And they just control, and I have to be careful what I say because I haven't made my decision here in terms right. of what we're doing. But they, they, what I wanted the publisher for was the collaborative effort to make the best book possible. And I'm like, is that there? Like, because I could get that with these other routes as well. But the, instead, they have so much control. So for someone that has this idea of what they really want to create, and requires a certain amount of creative control, I don't think it's a good idea at all whatsoever. So I know I said a, a lot there, but it's just this stuff is so elusive and, and fascinating. And it's just a it's just a wild world of like how to make the right decision for so many people. And it's very important. You know, one of the people that works for you, Charlie Hone, who's also been on my show, was like, Armand, make sure that this is not because of vanity. That's a yeah. very stupid thing to That's just sit there where, and do this because of vanity. There, there's a reason why vanity is one of the seven deadly sins <laughs> because people get caught yeah. up on, on vanity. Th think of it this way. You, you yeah. just nailed it. Uh, for whoever said that the only people who go self-publishing or the scribe route professional publishing uh, and not traditional, it's because they can't get a traditional deal. Well, watch this. We just, we talked about David Goggins. Uh, we've done the book for the first black woman in America to own a billion dollar company. Most people think it's it's Oprah. It's not. It's Janice Bryant Howroyd. She could have easily gone and got a traditional deal. We've mm -hmm. uh, we're working with Chris Voss, who did his first first book traditional. Never split the difference. Really? Uh, um, we're, 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 we've worked so with. He went traditional. He's coming now this yes. way to come with Scribe. Now it, we uh, Nassim Taleb, who did the Black Swan, we, yeah. we worked with N Nassim. So you you we just did the book for the uh, former CEO of Chipotle. Mm -hmm. Think about it. That guy was responsible for ten years of of turning Chipotle into what it is now. Easily could have got a traditional deal. Why are more and more people going with you know this this professional route? Because it just doesn't make sense anymore to go. Uh, uh, traditional and, and they're going the professional route with us. Outside of the money, what do you think is the driver like post in hindsight that people say, I'm so glad I went this professional route. What What are the big things that stand out to people? Uh, like you, like, you, that was you, a good. You own your, you, you own your book. You have more creative say in your book. When you go traditional, mm -hmm. 
they they have more uh we're going to cut this chapter uh we're not going to do mm. this this cover design you don't have 100 creative control uh, unless you're a stephen king jk rawling you know, okay then great you you have creative control but if you're that author who just happens to get a traditional publishing deal you don't have control they do it's the I'm whole point of signing that yeah, they, they have control. So whatever uh, chapter you may think is just the best chapter ever written, if they don't want it in there, it's not going in there. <laughs> Do you think they would even come and be like, we don't we don't like the style. We think you should yes. go more this way. Everything. Yes, huh? everything. Top to bottom, front to back, cover to cover, <laughs> side to side. <laughs> if, if, they, yeah. if they don't want it in there, it's not, because you have people who ultimately they're placing bets yeah. and they're trying to line up the best bet on this book selling copies so they right. can receive a return on their investment. And again, I don't knock them. That's their sure. business. Sure. No, it's a business model. Right. It's like a venture capitalist. Yeah. That, I mean, oh, you just nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. And we and know how that model works. It's it's we, a 70% we, we model. Do. Yeah, but actually honestly, Javon, I think that a venture capitalist requires less control and oversight than some of these publishers, man. It's yes. like I know plenty of entrepreneurs with venture backed companies and they're like, those people are not my boss. They're investors. Like I don't let them have control over the day to day or who I hire or how much I pay myself. Like, yes, there is a board that needs to approve things, but like I'm the decision maker, dude, when it comes to the publisher, one of my collaborators on this project and actually the agent as well was like, you know, we were talking about titles, titles matter to people. Like a lot of people oh, should be aware of this. The title of your book, you can put whatever you want, but at the end of the day, if the publisher wants to change it, they're going to change, change it. it. Yeah. Like they don't care. They're just like, no, we think this title will do better. Like you can fight them. You can argue, you can throw a fit, you can, you know, get all legal on them, but you're not going to get what you, that's it. You already signed. Like they have these, these control rights. Yeah. And uh, that devastates a lot of people cover design. Having the same final thing. say on your cover. Do you know how many horror stories I've heard of people like crying when when they're like, this is the cover we're going with. And they're like, this is hideous. Yeah. This is disgusting. I don't want this cover. This is my baby. It's like putting ugly clothes on a baby. <laughs> <laughs> think, think, think about this, Armand. We've all heard that, that uh, what, what's that phrase? Don't judge a book by its cover. Man, try telling a first time author that. Hey, yeah. that's the, no one's hearing that. They're like, no, no, no. This cover, for some people, the cover is more important than the actual content. I, I some know many of these people. Yes. I fundamentally agree. I, I think it's important. It's like, it is the physical representation of, of your creation. And so it's like, what does it look like? What is the energy it gives you every time you look at it? How does it look on your bookshelf behind you? How do you feel when you see it? These are these weird things that matter to a lot of people. And so I don't know, man. I mean, when I look at this industry and I look at this world, I think another author I spoke to recently was uh, Mike Michalowicz. So he initially wrote a book called The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur that he self-published like, you know, the, the, the very like basic way and you know, the way, you know, the FedEx way, like, you know, just, just kind of himself slapped it together, threw it on Amazon and he sold, he knows how to market, man. He's a businessman. Yeah. He knows how to market. He sold some copies That's and key. Random House reached out to him and they were like, so would you like to do more books? He talked me through this and he was like, look, I'm in a position now where I, I have leverage. I right. have leverage. I've proven that I can sell books. I am. He's not a Stephen King, but he's basically like at the top of like, you know, the business world in terms of small business books. And he's like, I have the leverage. I get to have the say, you know, I, I know I can sell books and they give me more more breaks and they let me do my thing. But that does not apply no. to like 99% of authors. Right. It doesn't apply to any first time author mm -hmm. uh, unless you're, you know, The Rock. Will Smith, you know, if they're if they're doing their book for the first time, yeah, they're going to have complete creative yes. control. But if you're just, you know, uh, X Y Z, you you grew a company to a hundred million, and you're doing your first book, no, you don't. You own zero creativity. I mean, Tim Ferriss tells this story. First time yep. author, four hour work week, dude. They gave him hell. Yep. He fought over the cover. He fought over the title. They thought the title was shitty and cheesy. 
uh, which it kind of is, but it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he owns it. He's like, it's a spammy title, but it really worked out. And it, it's and funny you, like... you said that. How many of uh, how many of those authors are here in Austin? I mean, think about it. I, yeah. Obviously, my, yeah. my co-founder, T Tucker, Max, he's here. Uh, Tim Ferriss, Ryan Holiday, Hal Elrod. Uh, yep. I mean, yeah, so many of them are here. And all, when you said that, I was like, damn, there's a lot of those authors here. <laughs> Yeah, well, they all a lot of them had to get out of California, man. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's what a, a mess. You're, you're about to, you're you're about to open up a whole different party, man. <laughs> I, I don't mind. I don't. Mind. So actually, you know, one of the things I would love to to talk to you about is like um, now you're in the process of writing your book as well. My second one. So my yes. my first book that we did, uh, I got there. I mean, I never wanted that book to be public. That book was done for, for my kids so they can right. have a legacy piece. Through a lot of conversation, encouragement, support, I agreed to make the book public. But, mm -hmm. man, that book was – there were things that I put in that book that I swore were going to the bottom of the ocean, chained wow. up in a safe. Wow. Uh, but, you know, it ended up being very therapeutic. It ended up being a big relief. Uh, it was kind of like, hey, here I am. This is who who I am, what I did. Uh, so I was happy we did it. But yeah, my, my second yes, book the is... Yes, the new one. Yeah, it's coming out in yeah. September. And mm -hmm. so September 25th is, is the publishing date. So we're excited for that. Yes, tell, tell us. Can you tell us about that book a little yeah, bit? Yeah, uh, the, the book's titled uh, Modern Leader. And what mm -hmm. it is, is what does modern leadership look like going forward? Uh, no disrespect to to those uh, currently in leadership, but it, leaders will no longer just just be. There'll still be some, but they won't just be the six foot two uh, white guy who had the perfect background, two parent home, best schools, introductions into corporate America. Uh, that's no longer what the new modern leader will look like. And wow. so this book will go into. Uh, different aspects of what uh, leadership will look like. You know, here, here's a, a great one. I, I put this post up yesterday. Uh, diversity has no finish line. You know, mm -hmm. just because you hired a chief diversity officer, you started using pronouns and you hired a few minorities, <laughs> you, you didn't win, you know? <laughs> and so diversity <laughs> has no finish line. Keep going, keep oh. going. And, and so you, you have so many people that are treating diversity as if it's there, there's a checkbox li list, you know, check boxes. And, and I'm going, okay, great. You, you hired a chief diversity officer. Now what? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, going forward, corporate America business will look incredibly different. And so it's, it's going to be up to us as a society on what does this look like going forward? You know, even, even yeah. my, myself in, in reclaiming my name uh, to Javon back from James. One of the coolest stories ever, actually, when we first met, you told me that story. Can you, can you refresh me a little bit, actually? Yeah. It, you know, so, so here, here's a great, great example of this. You know, I, I'll, I'll be, uh, matter of fact, this, we're, we're doing this on purpose. So I'll be 50 years old this year, man. I had never in a million years mm -hmm. thought that I would make it to 50, but, um, I'll be 50 this year. Back in my early twenties, when I was starting my career, I was trying to get on everyone's calendar. Man, I couldn't get an appointment to save my life. And one nice white guy was nice enough to pick up the phone. And he says to me, he goes, hey, I got a question. How did you end up with a black first name and an Irish, and an Irish last name? And what was funny is, man, I don't know where my last name comes from. My mom got that last name in the orphanage uh, back when she was in, in the orphanage. So I had this last name that we have no clue where, why, how we got this last name. So I was just happy to find out my last name was Irish. I thought that was the coolest thing. <laughs> but but when I hung up the phone, oh, man, it, it hit me. I was like, oh, I'm not getting on calendars because people are seeing my name. So my full name is Javon Thomas McCormick. So I started going by Armand the next week. Man, my calendar filled up. I got on people's calendars. I got appointments. And I was like, wow, okay. So I'm so sorry. But it just cut out as you said that part. So I'm going to repeat it. So you started going by JT. Yes. It, started, it kinda, started going by JT, JT. Yep. And and got on so many calendars, got so many appointments, nailed it. 
So then I, I said to myself, okay, I'll go buy JT. Well, man, I built my whole career on JT McCormick. And then last wow. year when the George Floyd murder happened, I was incredibly frustrated. I started seeing some of the just shallow status signaling bullshit. Excuse my language. I don't know if I'm no, allowed to say man. that, but uh, bullshit. Well, you say it all. Yeah. That that we were doing as a society. Armand, Blackout Tuesday on social media. Come on. That was a funny what, one. What, what, funny what one. the hell was that doing yeah. to, to move the needle forward? To no, make, man. I, I say I made the world a better place that day, didn't I? Yeah. I'm, and, and <laughs> here's the thing that's crazy. Half the people that did Blackout Tuesday were only doing it because they didn't want to get called out. And For so, sure. and, you know, and so I was like, that that's BS. Then we were arguing over a syrup bottle. A syrup mm -hmm. bottle. And, and I mean, Jemima, oh, baby. Man, how, what is that doing to progress us? So here's what, what where the game changer was for me. I saw an article that said there are only three Fortune 500 black CEOs. So mm -hmm. I went and looked their names up. Kenneth Frazier, Marvin Ellison, and Roger Ferguson. And then as a bonus, I went and looked. The wealthiest black man in America is named Robert Smith. So four very ethnic free names. Hmm. And, and I said to myself, hold on. Okay, I'm not a Fortune 500 CEO, but okay, I made it to the CEO chair. And our, our company has been named the, the top company culture in America by Entrepreneur Magazine. So we've done, mm -hmm. we've done a few things. And so then I, it hit me. I go, you know what? I'm going to start going by Javon. And I didn't do it for me. Because I had built my career going by JT. So I wasn't doing it for me. Here's who I did it for. Hmm. All of those kids from the communities that I grew up in, every kid that's named Martavius, Ravante, mm -hmm. Laquanda, Lucretia, I did it with the intent that maybe, maybe one day when you hit corporate America, you can work next to a Javon and not just a JT. Wow, man. That's so fucking inspiring. And that's so brave of you. Like, you're like, yes, finally, I'm in a position where I can do that. It sucks that you couldn't do that before. It's actually heartbreaking that you couldn't do that before. But there's so many people in your position that still wouldn't make that decision because it still takes bravery to make that shift again. It's interesting, man. I've, I've been asked, people have said, would you do it again? Hell yeah, I'll do I would have done it again because it was what was required at the time for me to do. Hmm. Now... My goal is to maybe set the pace to where it, it doesn't need to continue. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's sad. Many, many people won't say this out loud. I'll say it. You can have your undergrad from Harvard. You could mm -hmm. get your master's from Harvard. And maybe you even went to medical school and got your M MD from Harvard. But if at the top of your resume, it says Ravante Jenkins, you're going to be judged. Ne People won't even make it down to those Harvard credentials because they're going to see the name first. And so many people won't admit that, but that's just the fact in the world that we live in. It's so true. So one of the battles I see in society today is a confusion between, well, really, we see a lot of people attempting to create a level playing field. And there's a confusion between what is the right way to do that. I think that anybody with a brain wants to see an equality happen of the opportunity to at least not be judged when that happens. Now, when it comes to the equality of outcome, you see a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, disagreement. I don't know what the right way is because of the argument is, well, it's not happening naturally. We're not able to create the equality of opportunity. We've got to create these initiatives that create equality of outcome. I really don't know. It's a very complex question. As the author of this book, you know, coming out, you know, modern leader, like, what does that look like? What do you think is the solution to make it possible that someone doesn't get judged for their name? That's just one example of the ways that we discriminate. What does it take to start going in that direction and get more diversity in leadership roles, in Fortune 500, whatever it takes. I mean, you know, it's it's never one thing with with this topic itself. It, it's you, you know, it's complex, it's complicated. Very. It's it, but you have to start with all the little pieces. 
You know, mm-hmm. stop judging people by their name. And, and if you do see a Ravante Jenkins, give that kid an interview at best. Give him a shot. Go the extra mile. I mean, maybe his qualifications on the back end work experience don't line up, but give him a swing. And, and, and the reason being is because it's been so long before they've even had a chance to get in the door and have an interview. How, mm. how am I supposed to get get interview experience when I can't even get in the door because of my name? <laughs> you know, I mean, we're we're and, and and here's the other piece. I'll I'll call it what it is. Right now, the other thing that that's key is people don't want to say the word diversity. Right. See, we want to go down a path to make things easy on ourselves. So what do we do? We created D and I. Because D and I is a lot easier to say, but if you say diversity, oh, okay. Uh, now we're talking about people of color. Now we're talking about uh, gays. Now we're we're talking transgender. So that we've got all this different stuff that that's scary to talk about. We we don't want to talk about. So, but it's easier to say D and I. No, mm-hmm. say the whole damn thing: diversity and inclusion. So let's mm-hmm. start with these little pieces. Here's another one. You asked me. Um, Form all my HR professionals out there. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about this one, man? I am shocked. I, I'm very intentional with words because, you know, I, I, I have a GED. I have no college degree. Oddly enough, words matter to me. When I, when I was a kid and people would say sticks and stones may break your bones, but names are, no bullshit. <laughs> words hurt. <laughs> you know, when I was getting called zebra very and powerful. cookie, man, words hurt. Jesus. Okay. Uh, so here's one that I just can't put my head around and and it's been here for years. You'll hear HR professionals say, we want to recruit and retain. It's our top priority, man. Go look up the definition of retain who Mm -hmm. the hell wants to be retained. And so I, I, we have to change the language of what we're using as well. No one wants to be retained. And, and so when it comes going back to the diversity and inclusion, man, uh, this is more of a societal issue for mm-hmm. all of us. We have to realize that we can have differences of opinion. We can have different values. We can have different thoughts. And that's OK. And, and that's OK. And so when I look at the, the diversity piece of this, um, growing up mixed race, Armand, you know this, man, my, my, my dad was a pimp and drug dealer. My dad was black. My mom's white. Uh, and I tell people, man, you want to have a race conversation? Let me tell you what it's like when black people don't like you because you're half white and white people don't like you because you're half black. And, and I make the joke. I say to people, I go, look, I have been called white boy by black people, but white people have never called me white boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I go, I, you know, I just, I, I couldn't win. But what that yeah. did for me is I look at the world through the lens of what it's like to not be accepted. Mm. And I never fit the playbook. If you look at the playbook, the playbook right. is con- consist of two parent home, went to the good schools, got the introductions into corporate America, and you tend to gravitate towards the people you're comfortable with. So if if you went to the good schools and you came from a two-parent home, you tend to hire those people as well. Well, Mm. the guy that was named Javon, whose dad was a pimp that fathered 23 kids and mom was an orphan, and I can't tell you where my last name comes from, and all I have is a GED, I didn't fit the playbook. And so I had to find a way, how do you navigate this society by not being able to fit the playbook? So my goal is with this book, Modern Leader, we got to change the playbook. Wow. I think you're nailing it so, so at a deep root level with what you're going to put out. This playbook really should be how do I identify exceptional ability? Where yes. are the people that have desire, ability, a skill set? Maybe not even see the difference between ability and skill set as well as like 
skill set has to come from experience. So many of these people have not had the opportunity to develop the experience and the skill set. But you know what everyone can have if we could find it and seek it and create a playbook around it is ability, desire. Right. Can they learn? If you give them the tools and the opportunities and the mentorship and the right environment, does this person produce results? And that is something that we don't have the ability to showcase at all in this world. You're absolutely right. I mean, I've been through it myself, man. I've been through it myself. I mean, obviously, like, you know, when you look like me, basically, it's like most people in America are pretty uneducated when it comes to to other cultures and races. Like, that's just right. a matter of fact of like, being in America. Now, as someone who's like a world traveler and who's been around the world, I mean, man, I love traveling. It helps me learn about other cultures, religions, so many things. I go back to the countries I love and I talk to the locals and I learn, I learn, I learn. And you find that in Europe and Australia and other parts of the world, they're so much more educated about the different races. So if I go to somebody in um, Amsterdam and I say, and they go, you know, where are you from? I go, American. And the typical thing is like, yeah, yeah, but like, what's, you know, what's going on? Like, where, where, where are your parents <laughs> from? It's a funny question. If you're white and you say I'm American, okay, cool. At full stop. And st right. <laughs> they're right. like, they don't say, well, what kind? Like German or Irish or Dutch? <laughs> <laughs> English, right. but if you have some color, it's like, well, no, 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 where are you really from? So I go, okay, well, yeah, my parents are Persian. And they go, oh, yeah, I know all about like Iran. I know all about Persian Empire history and the Shah and this and that and the Islamic Revolution that happened and what it used to be like before. And I'm like, I haven't met a single one of you people in America that knows anything because we study our state history and our country history and that's about it when you when you zoom back a little bit and you look at what happened in america you look at 9 11 all these people just angry all of us including myself angry like that this happened that these right. middle eastern people of various backgrounds threw a plane into a building and killed thousands of people everyone is like what the fuck? this is one of the craziest things that's ever happened giant terrorist attacks when you look like me and you're uneducated, it's like, man, you start going through some stuff. I mean, oh, yeah. I felt it. It was like the first time in my life that I feel like I've really experienced racism. You yeah. know, that for the first, for, for a good 10 years a after 9-11, it was like, and then you know what people do is they go, they think that Muslim is a race. They're like, you're, <laughs> you, are you Muslim? I'm like, what the fuck do you mean am I? Like, what does that even mean? Like, do you understand that people in Indonesia are Muslim? In Africa? Like, it's a religion, right, dumbass. Right. Like, so there's just so much that you have to educate people on. And that is that becomes the cover of your identity. And what people don't know about me is I'm kind of like a hick. I like, you know, shooting things. I like going fishing. I'm like a very, like, rednecky kind of Persian. You know, so it's just funny. It's like, I'm, I, or the better way to put it is I'm, I'm balanced. I understand both sides. I'm not Republican yes. or Democrat. I'm a very balanced, moderate person. So when you try to judge people, it's terrible. And so one of the things that I've gone through with a name like Arman Asadi is like, yeah, I don't know how many times... I've been passed on. I don't even know, Javon, how many times I've been passed on with this book, yeah. with the publishers. Yep. I guarantee you some of them passed for that. Oh, I guarantee Even they though saw, they they're supposed the to be, the, absolutely. They absolutely. saw the name. Well, you know what, yeah. it, 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 it's funny too, man, you, you nailed it when you said, when you're overseas and people say, where are you from? Yeah. Here's how that question is asked in America. And, and, and it's it's a question that I just loathe. And I've been asked my whole life. What are you? Right. I'm freaking human. <laughs> I'm human. Now, and if yeah. you want to ask me, what's your nationality? Okay, that's a question. What am I? What, yeah, what, what are you? Like, yes. What are you asking here? What yeah, are you trying get to get? Because I'm, I'm human. But yeah, that's how the question is asked here, here in the States. And you know, we, we say this, and I appreciate you uh, 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 letting us go down this path. What, what's sure. interesting for me is you just saw this happen. And, and man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut some people deep on this one. We just saw this happen. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the Dante Wright incident up in Minneapolis, the, the kid, mm -hmm. the 20-year-old kid that, that got shot by the police officer. And the police officer yeah. thought they, they had their taser. 
Here's what was interesting to me, man. And, and I'm going to go here. Um, when that kid was shot, you watched the news, you read any article, whatever it said, a uh, black man uh, shot by the police in Minneapolis. Hmm. And that was the headline. Another black man shot by the police in Minneapolis. Here's what bothered me. If you saw his parents on TV, his mom is white, his dad is black. Hmm. He's mixed race. But hmm. the headline is black man shot by the police. Here's what's offensive to me with that. We have gone out of our way as a society to say, oh, first mixed race woman VP elected. We have gone out of our way to let you know that Kamala Harris is mixed race. Like we yes. have rolled out the carpet. We have <laughs> we have put uh, airplanes, have written messages in the sky, mixed race <laughs> vice president. And I'm like, okay. Cool. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're going to go out of our way to respect the fact that she's the first mixed race vice president that's been elected, why doesn't Dante Wright get the same respect of mixed race man shot by the police? You know why? Because that headline doesn't read the same as mm -hmm. another black man shot by the police. And, and I tell people this all the time. I know for me, being mixed race, that... I had my feelings hurt when everyone would say Obama was the first black president. Mm. He was the first mixed race president. Mm. And a lot of people don't know this. Obama went through the exact same thing I went through. Many people don't know Obama used to go by Barry because yeah. Barack was too ethnic. Barry so he would go by Barry, but he was mixed race. He was the first mixed race president. For me, mm. why that bothered me so much is growing up, mixed race, being be called uh, Oreo, being excluded, go, being shipped out and bused to, to uh, suburban schools. Hmm. I finally had someone, I was like, yes, we got a mixed person that's gonna be president. He made it to the top of the game, a mixed person. And when it was just first black president, first black president, I'm like, yeah. no, he's the first mixed race president. His mom's white, his dad's black. And just like me, I'm no more proud of being half black than I am of being half white. It's what I am. Mm. I'm mixed race. But, mm -hmm. but, but here's where I'm going with this. Follow me. We claim as a country, we want to change things. We want to progress and go forward. Okay. We're taking down statues. We're talking about syrup bottles. Okay, great. <laughs> great. I'm on board. Great. But here's what, what really bothers me. You know why we refer to mixed race people as black? Because there was a rule written back during slavery that if you had one drop of black blood in you, you were, you were black. If we're truly trying mm. to make our history right, don't we need to eliminate that too? Not just some damn statue in the middle of the city. Mm -hmm. so, so let's give Dante Wright his due respect and refer to him as mixed race, just like we're doing for Kamala Harris, just like we should do for Barack Obama, just like I asked people to do for Javon McCormick. God, man, you you are so dead on with all of this. And I so appreciate this like openness and vulnerability and refreshing perspective because it's so rare for people to step up and honestly share their thoughts on this stuff. And most people are just repeating what they hear their side, their little group, their ideology saying, and these are very original, fresh thoughts. Like these are not just the thoughts of some ideology that you're spewing. I think it's just so fascinating because it's like this whole race thing to me is absolutely interesting. On the one hand, we need to properly identify people and not call them, you know, unnecessarily call them black when they're actually mixed race, to your example. But on the other hand, it's like, no, 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 a human was shot. A right. human being like, how do we ever want to move beyond any of this? We need to talk about the fact that like, only if a person asks, is it necessary to even talk about that in the article, in a conversation? Like a human being was killed. This is what they did. This is what they were doing. These were the events that took place. Okay, very interesting. And uh, I guess I'm kind of curious, you know, what did they look like? What was, what were right. they ethnically? Like, that's just like a side note. I don't even know why I want to know. Maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't. And then you ask that question. It's like, oh, interesting. Okay, 
the guy was Syrian or born in Syria, moved here when he was three. Okay, that's interesting. Whatever. Like, you know, it's yeah. like, that's just a, it's a small aspect of what is happening in the world. And we're overdoing it. We're over like, just just we're, because it because it sells it sells and we're it, getting our news from the wrong place it sells and you and i both know this it's the american the american way we overcorrect something happens mm. we overcorrect and and yeah. i i don't know that there's such a thing as far as overcorrection when it comes to racism but if if we're good we need to make sure that we don't just correct for the show uh, of mm. things blackout tuesday take down some statues you know i i said this when the whole george floyd thing went on last year and, and again i'll say it out loud people ask me well, how i felt about it i said i'm frustrated and they're like why i go this isn't new so everyone's mm. running around oh this time just this is different this is different i go is it different because 41 million Americans are, are unemployed due to the virus disruption? Is it different because for the last two and a half months, we've been sheltered in place and we're pissed off? And so this gave us something to take to the streets and, and unleash our frustration? I said, because last time I checked, George Floyd is not the only man that died at the hands of law enforcement saying, I can't breathe. So why are we pissed off now? Why are we really upset? Is this going to be another Ferguson where for two and a half mm. weeks we're pissed off, we're angry, it makes the news, and then it goes away? Or are we really going to bring some change to this? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We do overcorrect. We go to yeah. an extreme direction and it's not done with integrity. So the right way would be that it's not just about the statues and syrup bottle and and now it's the, the the butter with the Native American that we took yeah. off. Oh my God! It was it was Uncle uh, Ben's on the rice. It was the syrup bottle. It, it, it's yeah. and don't get me wrong, great, but those are so far at the fringes of of right. what we really need to do, right? To bring change. I mean, it's I, like you said. I don't care what your name is. Can you do the job? Can you perform in the role? Ability. Can you execute? I, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I, I, I'll take it a step further. Here, here's, and I, I'll shut up after this, Armand. Um, <laughs> this so, is amazing. Keep it so going. I'm, I'm a God guy. You know, my, my, I, I, I believe in God, and and my kids go to private Christian school. But I've had people say, "Well, what, what is your stance on people that are gay?" I said, "Well, this will, this will tell you everything you need to know." So I'm a God guy, but. The here, here in our office, our director, she's responsible for probably the biggest segment of the company. Mm -hmm. She doesn't believe in God and she's gay. Mm -hmm. If she, God forbid she became paralyzed today, I would be the person at her house, giving her a bath, wiping her butt, brushing her teeth, picking her up, laying her down and reading a book to her. You know why? Because we can all have different values. We can have different beliefs. We can have different mm -hmm. thoughts, but we can all accept one another, respect one another. I, I tell people all the time, there's Lutheran, there's Catholic, there's Methodist, there's Baptist. Who the hell am I to say, nope, this one's the right one. We can all accept one another. It doesn't have to be this hard. And in my last piece on this, the commandment says, love thy neighbor. And it says, this is the most important commandment. Hmm. It doesn't say, love thy neighbor, but not if they're mixed race. It doesn't say, <laughs> love thy neighbor, but not if they're gay. Uh. So for me, I love thy neighbor, hmm. period. God, amen. I, I think you've eluded the answer to my next question in your statement right there. But what do you think it is that has made uh, the culture, the company culture at Scribe award-winning, positive, accepting, where people want to stay? Um, my, my opinion, it, first and foremost, you, you put people first. You know, I, I am a capitalist through and through. I, I you know, I, it hurts me to say nonprofit. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm all about profit, but I'm all about people first. You know, there, again, I got a GED, not a lot going on up here. 
I, I make things oh, real simple. Oh, come on, man. You're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Don't play I, me like that. I, I make things real simple, Armand. Um, people, process, profits. If you have great people, you can build great process. You can make great profits. And as a great benefit, hmm. you can with those profits, you can do incredible things for the communities that you serve. But when you make profits, hmm. you got to do right by people. And so for us, if you say what makes the, the, the culture so incredible, it's real simple. In your role, people will ask all the time, so how can I be successful at Scribe? Okay, simple. Perform in your role, execute, drive results, and then third, uphold the principles and values. That's it. Mm. That, that's it. But we always put people first. And there's so many little things that go with that, man. Okay, great. I'm, yeah. I'm the president and I'm the CEO. Um, you know, I'm the largest equity holder of the company. Okay, great. But guess what? No one works for me. People mm -hmm. work with me. No one works for me. You work mm -hmm. with me. I'm no more important to this company than, than everyone else. You know, everyone has a role. We all have to execute. Um, so there's so many little things within the culture. Um, here, here's a big one. And this, I, I say this to anyone who's in leadership. Yes. We don't have direct reports. Hmm. We have direct supports. Meaning if you are in leadership, your whole role is to support the people that you serve. That's it. So you don't have direct reports. You, you, we, you are a direct support if you're in leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here's a, 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 an example of this. I heard so many people saying low-level tasks. Oh, we need to hire someone that, that's for a, a low-level task. You know, we, we need to make sure that low-level task gets taken care of. And then finally, I, I stopped the whole company. Everyone was here. And I said, wait a minute. I got a question. How many of you here have seen me take out the trash? Some people had seen me. Okay. I said, all right, great. I said, how many people here have seen me clean out the storage closet? Some people raise their hand. I said, for those of you who have traveled with me to a conference, how many people have, you, have seen me in a suit on my hands and knees, ironing the, the uh, cloth that goes for the booth? People raise their hand. I said, okay, so if we all have seen that, someone please tell me what the hell a low level task is. I said, because here's the thing. If that trash overflows for two weeks, Tell me how low level it becomes all of a sudden that we're pissed off. Mm. Like, what the hell is going on with the trash? I go, but here's the whole, the, the real importance behind this. Please hear me when I say this. How can you uh, expect someone to perform at the highest level in their role when you just told them their responsibilities are low level? How mm. contradictory is that? Wow. So there's no, there's no low level task. There's only task, duties, and responsibility. There's no low level. There's no high level. Everyone mm. works together. Wow. I mean, I think that's pretty clear how you've created an incredible culture. Um, these are very modern <laughs> leadership, you know, takes. And uh, it's very refreshing because most companies that I, I mean, before I ever became an entrepreneur, wow, at this point, almost a decade ago, none of this existed none of this and i know for a fact that it still doesn't in most companies and most startups uh anywhere there is this idea that the you know there's a hierarchy still and yeah. i think like certain i understand like you need an org chart you need to know like who belongs in what role and what seat right person right seat all that kind of stuff but ultimately it's about support it's about showing up and i don't know if you you probably are very aware of this but for anyone else you know really watching and listening like I noticed how you said that ultimately it's about people in the company, right? But that's also where you started. The reason that Scribe does what it does is because of the focus on people in yep. making those author's dreams come true. So if the focus is to do it for the, the client, the customer, the world, and it happens within the organization, it's like, wow, look at that feedback loop. Of well, Ar Ar Armand, work. you you're gonna love this. All right. All right, so man, we all have heard this. You you've heard it advertised on commercials. You've heard people in in magazines, corporations. How many times have you heard customer customer satisfaction is our number one priority? You've heard yes. that. 
Customer satisfaction is our number one priority. You've heard so many companies scream that from the mountaintops, put it in magazine articles, the Wall Street Journal, run a commercial. You've seen that over and over again. Now, follow me here. Who the hell wants to be satisfactory? If my wife goes to girls night on Friday and someone says, hey, how's your husband? Ah, he's satisfactory. I'm going to be pretty pissed off. <laughs> Dude, you are if, if, if my if my children, if someone says, hey, how's your dad? I satisfactory. I'm going to be pretty angry. So why is the bar satisfaction? We want authors to have a phenomenal author experience with us. Hmm. We want this, and for the people, our, we call ourselves a tribe, for the tribe members in the company, we want this to be a phenomenal career for you. If you want a job, go there. You want a career, come here. And we want to make sure that you have a phenomenal career, that the culture is phenomenal. We want to make sure that we put people first. But satisfaction is the bar? Who the hell wants to be satisfactory? <clears throat> Nobody. That's a terrible. I don't think anyone's ever noticed that or at least called it out. <laughs> Man, like like I said, it's not a lot going on terrible. up here. I just deal in common yeah. sense. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, um, Javon, like this has been everything I wanted it to be and more. You are an exceptional human being. You really are. I want to just commend you and recognize you for for the energy you bring, the positivity that you bring, the joy. I mean, I'm, I'm like filled up with joy. I'm inspired. We had a deep conversation about racism even. I mean, it's just, I love it that you're just, you allow yourself to express yourself and be human and be honest. I really appreciate that. What is the way in which I and my audience, everyone watching, everyone listening can support, can support you individually, can support Scribe? What, what would that be? And I, I limit my social media. I am only on LinkedIn. I, I find that to be the most professional of, of all of them. So I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. And then obviously you can find me at scribemedia.com. But yeah, I limit my uh, social media, man. It's, it's people, I feel that the world would be a better place if more people limited their, their amount of, of social media. It's, if you allow me to go on one more tangent, Armin, I, I'd appreciate it. It's, um, we, we hear this since you, you brought up Tim Ferriss earlier. Yes. Everyone, especially now, one of the hot phrases is um, work-life balance, work-life balance. Everyone's talking work-life balance. Here's my problem with work-life balance. One, I think it's bullshit. And mm. here's why. If you say work-life balance to people right off the bat, you say, hey, what does work-life balance mean to you? First thing you're going to hear from people, don't work 60, 70 hours a week. Don't check your emails first thing in the morning. Don't, you know, we should only work the four-day work week. Everyone's going to attack work. Work, work, mm. work. No one, no one attacks life. No one says, hey, you know what? We should probably limit our social media. We mm. probably shouldn't binge watch Friday at six o'clock to Sunday at six o'clock Game of Thrones and have the nerve to wake up on Monday morning pissed off because we haven't achieved our dreams and goals. No one says, Ooh. you know what? I probably shouldn't be at the bar Thursday through Sunday, but then be pissed off on Monday morning because I don't like my job. No one does that. When's the last time you heard someone say, whoo, or my man, all weekend, we binge studied our financial future. Oh, Nobody never. does that. No, but we, that. but we will spend hours and have the nerve to brag about it. Oh man, I saved fifty bucks on Hotels.com. We found some great uh, hotel rooms out in Vegas for, for the weekend. When's the last time you spent three hours on your four hundred one k? No one attacks life. And here's the thing: mm. I'm not knocking people who like to binge watch. What I'm knocking is, if you're going to binge watch Friday through Sunday, don't you dare wake up on Monday mm. pissed off about where you are in life. Couldn't agree with you more. I'm actually going through a very similar phase. I fundamentally agree with the notion that social media is extremely unhealthy and makes people unhappy. That's extremely, extremely clear. Like, it's as clear as it gets. Think about I it. Recently we're, we're, we're deleted so Instagram. Many 
we're, we're letting so many people define our success for us. We, we see the perfect family. We see the, the, the person with the car, the house, a stack of money, $100,000 watch, and we're letting social media define success for us. Success for some people may be a tiny house out in the middle of nowhere making $36,000 a year. And you know what? Yes. That's okay. If that's your definition of success, embrace it. Stop chasing someone else's definition. Well, it has to be internal. It has to be driven from an internal place. Um, I mean, if you are seeking some sort of like external uh, bar that you need to reach, yes, success can be done in that way is the way you're describing. But the person that 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 is success for is ultimately in love with their life, with the process, what right. they get to do day in and day out. Like if they get you know, some sort of acclaim or award or reward or money in addition to what they settled for, that's just a cherry on top from the that's external it. world, but it has to be driven from the internal. And man, I realized it. I was like, whoa, like Instagram is obviously the hottest platform. It's where everyone's attention is, but it's fucking me up. It's making yeah. me anxious. It's making me like constantly pick up my phone. I looked at my screen time and I was like, whoa, that is not good. That is disgusting. See, so I had to delete that's it. That's what I'm talking about, man. Th think about that, Armand. If, if you and I, here's, you and I go to lunch, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is just some shit I've never understood. So we go to lunch and our food comes out. It's looking good. I grab my phone. I take a picture of my food. And we both know you never get the first picture right. So I take three pictures of my food. <laughs> then I upload the picture to, you know, whatever platforms, you know, Instagram, Facebook, what, whatever, wherever, you, you know, your, your platform is. Then I got to put a caption. Oh, looks good. We're at such and such restaurant. Then I set my phone down. Okay. Now I take a bite. God forbid my phone vibrates or dings or, or whatever. Then I got to look at it. Oh man, I got, I got two likes. No, but here's the worst part. God forbid I pick up that phone and I got a comment. Now I got to Now I got to respond to the comment. And, and, and here's the deal. I, I know you said I, I was okay to, to use foul language. Who the yeah. fuck cares where you're eating lunch? I don't care. <laughs> Nobody lunch. cares. Enjoy it. Enjoy your Nobody lunch. Cares. Great. Do your thing. You know, if, it, if it's that meaningful to you, next time you see me, tell me about it. Oh, man. Our mom and I went to lunch at XYZ. It was <laughs> great. Stop posting bullshit. No one cares that you just checked into Whole Foods. No one cares that you were at the gym. No one wants to see your, your, your set you just did on the bench. Nobody gives a damn. Stop posting Nobody. Shit. Nobody. <laughs> Fire, man. Fire. It's so funny because when I deleted it, I also wrote a post about my thought process of why I'm deleting it. And I was like, one of the things I exactly said was like, I sat down one weekend and I realized none of you give a shit right. what I am doing, what I am barbecuing, what I am eating, what my workout was. None of you give a shit. So instead, what I am going to do is sit back, regain that time, come back to the center of my reality and create beautiful, intentional, useful things that you, my audience, would actually find insightful useful totally. there's utility in them and instead go for things that are more evergreen and more uh tangibly like valuable versus this bullshit that is distracting me of like here's an article i found great whatever go to cnn.com right. instead like i'm yep. not that guy like why don't i create something write something do a video do an interview with javon put that out into the world like See, that's man, to me so much more valuable you you just nailed it so linkedin for me you know what I do? I post my mistakes. Hmm. And here's why. Think about this. We have the nerve as a society to say, oh, you learn the most from your mistakes. But nobody tells you their mistakes. No one hmm. shares their mistakes. You and I can go right now and look at every blog post, every article, and we can find millions of pieces of content of Top five things Jeff Bezos does to be successful. Top 10 things Steve Jobs did to be successful. Mm -hmm. We can find the top 10 list of, of success for Elon, Jeff, Bill Gates. You, you name the person. Can someone give me the damn top 10 mistake list? Because I want that one. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. no one shares their mistakes. So when I post on LinkedIn, 
I do my best to share mistakes. Here's some of the dumb shit that I did throughout my career. Here are some of the things that I learned from. Here are some of the mm. things I'll never do again. Because even this, we have the phrase fail fast. Man, mm -hmm. I got a GED. I don't want to fail fast at anything. I'm trying to learn faster. And so mm. for me, to hell with fail fast. I want to learn faster. We all make mistakes in life, but you only fail if you stop trying. I've got mm -hmm. a lot of failed relationships because we broke up. We're not together anymore. Yeah. But when I made some massive mistakes as a first time president of a software company, the goal is to learn, grow, and not repeat your mistakes. But mm. you only fail if you stop trying. I, I completely agree with that. Failure is giving up. It's, it. it's just it's when you walk away, when you put it down and yeah, some things in life, like a relationship that isn't working yep. or some toxic thing, you got to put it down. You got to eventually put give it up. down, man. But when it comes to your career, you don't really want to do that. You just want to keep no. learning and you want to avoid man. repeating the mistake. Yeah, I Even totally this, agree with if, that. If you set a goal to lose 30 pounds in three months and at the end of the three months, you came up five pounds short. You only fail if you stop trying. Give yourself another two weeks so you can drop that last five pounds. But right. if you just say, ah, man, didn't hit it. Let's go to McDonald's. That's bullshit. <laughs> you only mm -hmm. fail if you stop trying. Learn, grow, don't repeat. Hmm. This is just such, uh, you know, honestly, I think that some of the things about leadership, success, ultimately come down to these like really simple principles, but we tend to complicate it. We overcomplicate it with like tools and pro like, like too much, uh, you know, uh, especially in the startup world, uh, the world that yes. I recently entered into, it's like everything is highly technical and everyone is over, uh, overdoing it over like, it's just too complex, but really it comes down to these basic things. If you want employees or people or a team or a tribe, as you said, that's, that's happy, uh, and and fulfilled, you know, one of the things I look very closely at is what makes people fulfilled in the workplace. Yes, like <laughs> it is not, um, you know, the things that people assume it's not. And that's why we've seen such such shifts. And I think it does come down to like, huh, no matter who I am, what my beliefs are, or who I am outside of work or inside of work, like I'm just accepted. And, and yeah. that's like, and, and I and there's a high bar and I got to meet it and I got to perform. And that actually creates a feeling of progress for people, right? The feeling of progress then creates a feeling of I'm productive, I'm I'm effective, I'm 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 I have joy when I move forward that way. So, all of these things, like overall, this whole conversation, I'm just seeing how it all ties together in like your personal philosophy that not only do you live for yourself, but you're you're living as a leader of your company. You know, man, you 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 nailed it there. We overcomplicate things. Uh, for me, man, life. Work-life balance. Here, here's my work-life balance. I have five pillars. God, health, family, business, and investing. If it doesn't fall in those five pillars, I don't do it. I, hmm. I like to believe, you know, I've, I've made a little money in my career and in investing, so I like to believe that I could probably afford the ESPN subscription on DirecTV, but I don't hmm. have it. You know, I love football. But unless Tom Brady is sending me part of that $20 million, I don't give a damn what Tom Brady did at the Super Bowl. But mm -hmm. here's the thing. We, we, as a society, we try to do too much. Mm -hmm. and so if it doesn't fall in my five pillars, I don't do it. I love golf, love golf. But mm -hmm. I've got four kids at home, seven, six, four, and two. Wow. I'd rather have that four and a half hours with my children than on the golf course. But mm. we, we as a society, we won't check ourselves and say, okay, what are the things that are so important to me that I'm willing to cut everything else out of my life? And for me, mm. God, health, family, business, and investing. Everything else, wow, I don't do it. Beautiful, beautiful. Just to loop it back and kind of close with this thought around, you know, a lot of the authors or future authors that are listening, what would be the kind of parting advice for the person who really uh, believes that they have a book in them? Do you have content for a book? You know, there's a lot of people out, out there and, you know, I may hurt your feelings, but one of the things that we say internally is we will hurt your feelings before we let you publish a bad book. And 
ask yourself, do I have enough content for a book or is this a blog post? Mm -hmm. So many people, they got a couple stories, they've done a couple things and all of a sudden they, they believe they have a book in them. Well, you may have a book, but it may not be on that topic that, that you're, you're going down. There's some people who have seven books in them and they're mm -hmm. trying to put all seven into one book. Nope. We've got to parse this out. We can't put all seven books in one book. So let's figure out which book we're going to start with first. But before all of that, ask yourself, fast forward, you got a beautiful cover. You've got this great content. Mm. Define success. What's success in this book? And I'll give you an example. For me, success for my book, when I first did it, was having five copies for my children, mm. for my great grandchildren. So they would have a legacy piece to know where I came from. That was it. I didn't care if I sold a copy. I never wanted to make the book public. I would have literally paid $250,000 to have those five copies to have a legacy piece for my children, given my background wow. and where I come from. So you have to be able to define success with your book. And the answer cannot be, I want to sell a million copies and be a New York Times bestselling author. <laughs> Gold, man. Gold. I appreciate you so, so, so much. I will make sure to uh, link to your LinkedIn and obviously to Scribe. And I highly recommend, we're going to be chatting here in a minute. I highly, as I've said in my previous videos, recommend Scribe. I mean, look at the leadership, look at people that work there. I mean, it's a beautiful company. And I mean, it's the right choice for so many people these days. And honestly, you have only just begun, Javon, with your personal journey but with the journey of you know how you're completely transforming this industry i really feel that like even though it's been 6 years like it's only just begun yes sir hey i appreciate it. this was great humbled flattered uh, i'm always honored that that people even want to hear me so that this was inc incredible i i appreciate it thank you thank you so much Siobhan.